Ever wonder what is going on behind the scenes as the government investigates criminal cases? Are you interested in the strategies the government employs when bringing prosecutions? I'm your host, Greg Soferin, along with my colleagues in Hush Blackwell's White Collar Internal Investigations and Compliance Team. We will bring to bear over 200 years of experience inside the government to provide you and your business thought-provoking and topical legal analysis as we discuss some of the country's most interesting criminal cases and issues related to compliance and internal investigations. Welcome to the latest edition of the Justice Insiders. Joining us today for the third time, fortunately for us, is Professor Richard Epstein, a scholar, a professor, an author who has weighed in previously on this case that the Supreme Court recently decided. We've struggled very much on the name of it, and we've called it Jarkeski, Jarkeesi. I was told earlier today that the actual pronunciation is Jarkesi, and that was used by Mr. Jarkesi's lawyer during the course of the argument in this case. No matter the name, it's had a big impact, and we're very lucky to have the good professor with us today. And I'm also joined by my colleague and friend, Steve Renault, who's the head of thought leadership here at Hush Blackwell. Professor Epstein, you guessed it on our last episode regarding the Jarkesy case, that the court would go this way, that it would likely break down the way that you described in our prior episode, six to three, and uh, that it would be decided on narrower grounds than some of the grounds that were available to the court and cited by the Fifth Circuit. Let me just throw a couple interesting headlines at you. Many people are looking at this as the end of the world making all kinds of arguments about how it's going to destroy the government. I'll just read a few of the headlines and see if, when we start talking about this, whether you think this is right. We'll call it Jarkesy case strips enforcers of in-house expertise speed. Supreme Court's right wing delivers gift to corporate criminals. Supreme Court just lit a match and tossed it into dozens of federal agencies. Wall Street's Supreme Court win could slow energy enforcement. The Supreme Court won't stop dismantling the government's power, the campaign to gut Washington's power over corporate America, and the Supreme Court's latest power grab, regulatory oversight. Are these headlines right, or are they wrong? Let's try and sing. (laughs) This is the kind of thing that says, well, you know what the greatest threat to democracy is. His name is Donald Trump. And this is essentially the same page given at the efforts to try to tame the administrative state. And it always starts to deal with questions of hyperbole. Uh, The first thing I guess that one wants to know is that we had a very robust system of enforcement of the SEC, including some very strong opinions in favor of both it and the other side, long before the Dodd-Frank Act of 2010, which was the statute in the name of jealous reform, made the first fundamental violation of the principles of separation of powers. What it did is it managed to concentrate the power to prosecute, the power to decide, and the power to enforce in the hands of a single agency. Uh, That is the definition of tyranny. If you go back as far as James Madison, about how it is that governments ought not to act, there's nobody to check anything that those characters wanted to do. And so to say that this is sort of the end of the world means that you think that there's a very simple model, which is whatever Lola wants, whatever Lola gets, is that every time the SEC wants to bring a prosecution, it's fully justified, fully meritorious, fully respectable. And so therefore, everybody else wants to get out of the way and let them do what they want to do in these cases. And what happens is the people who are always most pious about the necessity for their actions turn out to the people who are most systematically deviant with respect to the norms and behaviors that they follow. There is an old Roman maxim, which these people seem to forget, called Nemo Udex and Causa Sua. Uh, which means that nobody should be a judge in his own court. That not only applies to private individuals, where there's the obvious danger of bias, but it also applies to government agencies. And it turns out Jarkasi, or however you pronounce it, is not the only case, or early cases like Lucy and so forth, in this particular one, where the SEC basically got up a full head of steam and decided to go after individual people. It decided to pick the administrative judges that it wanted, It didn't do it by rotation the way it is when you go to federal court. What happened is they picked their favorite characters whose conviction rate sometimes was virtually 100% on all cases with maximum sentences, put them loose, told them to enter into a general opinion, 
And then what they did is they ratified that opinion through the commission. So you've already gone through three or four years, and then you have to go into federal court to see if you get upset what's going on. And one of the things that's so clear, and the Supreme Court has made this clear in other cases, if you can't challenge the jurisdiction of a particular body at the outset of a hearing, then in effect, you've necessarily lost because they could put you through the ringer for two or three years before you get into a court. And then it's God knows what's going to happen when it comes to the way in which the enforcements go. And so uh, the SEC is notorious for bankrupting people who have had successful ones against it in the court so that they cannot fight. There was one case in which what they said the remedy was, oh, you appointed the actual judges in these cases in a way that violated the appointments clause. And so we have to start over. And what they then did is they looked to what would be the right way to sue the appointments, that is to put them through the head of the agency. They do that, and then they started the same game all over again. Uh, what you really needed in that case, and what you really need in most of these cases, is a general notion that, that due process, not just the questions about right to jury, but all sorts of collateral rights, including those that Justice Gorsuch talked about as an opinion, are in fact going to be put into place. So you can't get this kind of massive concentration of power against a single individual. And you know, they started to talk about corporate America going free. This was a two-bit guy. I bet he had $24 million at stake in his particular fund. I mean, if you're trying to figure out where that stands on the power grub, I'm not a real expert on all of this stuff, but I would assume that this guy would not be in the top 10,000 people who are working in financial markets. Uh, his set of industrial concentration ratios would be so small that nobody could find them. And what you really have here is not a situation of mighty people getting off. You have a situation in which very arrogant people decide the SEC have rather tenuous cases. And what they then do is they pick on some weak link inside the private sector in order to, shall we say, shake their limbs and to pose a threat to everybody else. So far from this being good justice, this is the worst kind of behavior imaginable. And the Supreme Court was right to stop it down in this particular case. What they should have done is to make it even larger, the correct rule in each and every one of these cases involving an agency enforcement is you may bring the case but you have to bring it before an independent tribunal, a judicial tribunal. There are two kinds of flavors with judicial tribunals. One is an Article III court, the standard court. It turns out these courts are actually in disfavor today because they're ponderous and they have lifetime tenure. There's a long history of Article I court associated with the rise of what they call public rights. And uh, if you look right now, the bankruptcy court and the tax court are Article I courts for 15-year terms. They have a good deal of independence. That's what they should do in this particular case. Put it in a court, get some neutral official to do this, and you won't see this kind of outrage taking place where it turns out here or with the PTAB, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, what you do is you get the head of the agency deciding on an ad hoc basis who it is that they want to judge a particular case. And then if they don't even like the outcome, they could basically change the panel in order to dictate a different result, including one which puts them in the final driver's seat. All of this stuff goes underneath the mirror, but the idea that somebody would want to say that what's going on here is corporate America is ripping off the government, it shows in effect that the lessons of public choice have not been learned, that just as private firms could take advantage of the government, so it is that the government could take advantage of private firms, and you have to actually look at the facts. And on this particular case, it's not close. This was an outrage. Uh, we haven't brought the entire thing to an end, but it's an important move in the correct direction of making sure that the administrative state does not simply run unregulated in ways that are abusive, are really a threatening uh, to ordinary individuals, to ordinary businesses, and to ordinary liberties. What about the argument, Professor, though, that Justice Sotomayor brings up, which is that you already have stare decisis, you already have a precedent for doing exactly this kind of thing. Seemed like the majority and the and Justice Roberts and Justice Sotomayor argued about what did the precedent that was in place relating to these issues actually mean? I guess my question is, you have two very different interpretations. I noticed that in the opinion itself, uh, Justice Roberts says that uh, the court's opinions governing this exception, and we're talking about the public rights exception here upon which the opinion was based, have not always spoken in precise terms. And so you get this big argument between the majority and, and the dissent about whether or not the precedent in this area supports their positions. What, what are your thoughts on that? The justice side, Sotomayor position, simply doesn't understand the origin of the scope 
for the explanations to why this weird doctrine started to look. So what you have to do is go back to the beginning and the, the situation having to do with Murray against the city of Hoboken, a case that was decided in 1856 by the Supreme Court. And what you had there was a small time club who essentially managed to fleece billions, millions, well, a very large number of dollars out of the customs office. And these guys wanted to go back and to get that kind of money from them. And so what they did is they started to do, as everybody had done, those procedures in the body that had been sent up to try these cases uh, by the customs authority. Now, how did this body start to get its own independence? It was not authorized by the Constitution. What happened is back around 1810 or so forth, you had a large amount of cases that were disputed as to whether or not some kind of tax or tariff revenue a payment ought to be imposed on private individuals. And you get one office in Baltimore and another office in New York coming out with opposite conclusions. So somebody says, hey, we better find out somebody higher in the administrative structure who can decide which of these two guys are right. And it turns out that starts off first as a kind of erratic and fragmentary practice. But by the middle of the 19th century, at the latest, like say 1820 and so forth, it had solidified. So that internal to the Customs Bureau, there was some guy who essentially sat there and acted as an adjudicator of these claims. And it was understood that he was not supposed to just be an ed- a collection agency, but to decide whether these things were right and wrong. And this thing went on happily for about 30 years, and nobody doubted the constitutionality of these courts because it just seemed to work. And then you get this particular case, and already somebody comes along and he says, you know, this is illegal. There are no such things as Article I courts. Uh, There's an oxymoron. And so the Supreme Court justices were faced with a very great difficulty. They can say, you're right. We're originalists. We look at the text. And the only kind of judicial bodies that you can create are those that go through Article Three. And these guys don't do that by the way of the appointment and the jurisdiction and the term of office or anything of that sort. So what you then do is you wipe out 40 years of administrative work uh, that had taken place and leave everybody in limbo. Well, the Supreme Court did not want to do that. And this was, in effect, the respect of stare decisis in the sense there's a long, coherent tradition going on without any real evidence of abuse. And so what they had to do is to figure out a way in which they could keep this stuff alive without putting an end to everything associated with Article 3. And what they did is they hit upon this term of what counts as a public right. And the original definition, which is the correct definition, not always followed, is a public right is something where it is in effect that the government has a claim against some particular individual who has kept money from it under situations associated, for example, with the patent office and so forth. So what they're doing is they're suing not under general legislation, but they're suing in order to collect the kinds of things that have been collected in these courts from the beginning of time. And it was essentially an ad hoc exception designed to respect past practice. Now, we've done it elsewhere. Now, very recently, there are various of cases about whether or not you can appeal a judgment from the military courts to the Supreme Court, and they are not constituted under Article Three. And what Justice Kagan said, although she got it here, was, you know, we've been doing this for 60 years. I don't want somebody telling me that we can't do it. No matter what the argument is, we're just not going to change that. And so there was an extremely elegant article written by my former student and friend, Amitai Bamza, who showed, in effect, that these practices were not in conformity with the initial constitutional norm. And the response of everybody is, if it goes on long enough and consistently enough, then, in effect, we can do this particular thing. And we're talking 50 years, and we're talking about a situation where there was no evidence side of partiality or bias with respect to the adjudication. None of those conditions were satisfied here. And so what Justice Sotomayor does is she said, I think a public right involves anything that is passed by a statute of Congress. Well, oh my God, if that's the definition of a public right, then everything's a public right. Because you start passing all sorts of comprehensive statutory legislation and so forth. And then in the legislation, you said, you are not allowed to go into an Article III court to try this particular case since it's a public right, you have to go into this mayor's nest and have your luck before this panel. Well, think about this. Separation of powers is a doctrine which is designed to constrain Congress, to restrain the courts, to restrain essentially the executive. And if you say, in effect, that Congress can simply get rid of judicial situation by designating this as cases that have to go before an initial panel, it can do it with criminal law, it can do it with everything. And so what Justice Roberts said is you can't do it. 
Now, uh, there was an earlier case called Oil States Against Green, which was a terrible opinion by Justice Thomas, who just didn't get it right. And notice he switched sides in this case, where they did exactly the same thing with patent cases. And they said, you don't get to litigate this patent case in federal court, district court. You have to come before us. And who's going to be the judges? Well, I'll tell you when I get to it. And they literally had rules in which they could appoint a panel of three ad hoc, not by rotation. If they didn't like the judge, they'd expand the panel to five. And then in this case, they expanded it to seven, where the two guys in charge of the agency went on there to make sure they won by four to three verdict. I mean, this stuff is not even kosher. It's not even close to kosher. And I, I just simply do not understand why she put such faith in that when they're talking about a particular case in which the guys who are most vulnerable to this kind of abuse are little guys like Lucia and Jacques Aze, whatever his name is, and these guys get beaten up to a pole. The larger fellows basically don't get worn out because they're exhausted by administrative remedies. They have more wealth. So this is an effect attack on the little man. Uh, the dissent was very irresponsible in the way in which it dealt with this situation. It was a sad day, I think, in American jurisprudence where somebody could be so enamored of the administrative state that the most elementary procedural violations, the real piling on that you saw in this kind of case, gets an applause instead of a condemnation. The criticism that one makes of the adjocacy decision, at least by, us, by the chief justice, is one that always is made of his decision. He's something of a constitutional minimalist. So go back to the case having to do with the insurrection charges, right? There were so many reasons why those particular lawsuits were wrong. And what did the chief justice do? He found a ground in which to throw them out on which everybody could agree because he did not want to get into the definitional question of what counts as that. As an insurrection, who counts as an officer of the United States and so forth? He said either Congress authorizes these actions or the guys in Colorado and Maine can't bring them on their own. And he likes that sort of stuff. What it does is it gets you out of big trouble and it leaves you to fight the grander issues on some later day. Now, I'm much more of a, shall we say, a, a judicial maximalist. I'm willing to go the whole hog. But I understand why it is that when you're facing with this, a justice would say, pull his punches, win the case, and wait for another day to get it clean. Is this opinion then, as you point out, it's constitutional minimalism, or at least not trying to upset the entire apple cart. Is this the first of a chipping away where eventually we'll get all the way there? Or do you think this is as far as the majority is willing to go? No, I don't think it's as far as they're going to go. And I think there's a reason. You go back, you have to look at what the Seventh Amendment said, and it talks about actions at common law. And then the Giafranca case, or whatever it's called out there, in which what Justice Roberts said is, if you're in a bankruptcy situation and there's a question of fraud or akin to fraud, it has to be tried by a jury and not before a bankruptcy tribunal. And so that's it. Now, let's change it a little bit. Drop the argument that we want to get you for fraud. And what we want to do is now to basically ban you from the profession for the next 10 years. That's not a jury question. That's an injunction. And the injunctions don't go to get common law action. And so what the SEC does the next time is that we're going to forget the fine. We just want to keep you out of business. And that's a serious attack on somebody's livelihood. And they say, we don't have to give you a jury trial because there's no fact issues of common law. Well, at that point, the due process issues have to be raised in connection with the courts of equity. And somebody's going to have to sit there and say, can you go to a court of equity and basically throw somebody out of his profession for the next 10 years without giving him the kind of protection that he needs and would get in a federal court? And the answer to that question will end up being no. One of the things that was made in a lot of these briefs, uh, some of them brought by the New Civil Liberties Union, including a truly superb brief by my uh, friend and former student, Jonathan Mitchell, um, in which they start to talk about the way in which when you come before these bodies, it's not that you just lose the jury trial, it's all sorts of discovery advantages that you would otherwise have are going to be stripped and taken from you. And those things really matter. And so I don't think that they can stop here. What's going to happen is it's going to be the usual game of legal ping pong. The government's going to look at this saying, we don't want to give up on these guys because you know we're out there with God's mission. So we'll just frame it as a case in equity to avoid the jury. And then somebody's going to come back and say, look, the due process issue is very much alive. And that was the reason why you saw the Gorsuch concurrence. Um, if you looked at his first sentence, he's telling you this is part of a mosaic 
of controls, of which part number two turns out to be the due process clause, um, which essentially applies to all legal proceedings. And one doesn't want to simply treat this as an institutional case, i.e. juries and no jury. You want to treat it as an individual liberty case uh, so that you get the preconditions of a fair trial. And I do think, in effect, if that case comes up, uh, the government will lose yet again. And my hope is what they will do, either by legislation or otherwise, is establish a routine practice that they never, ever bring serious cases to anything worth you know, a suspension or a $100,000 fine or something inside the agency. Inside agency deliberations should be done the way they are. In some of the immigration and social security cases, there are a huge number of cases on small issues that require some kind of technical expertise. And in general, if you try to run them in the political and in the legal system, they will overwhelm everything. And so you do them administratively, where in effect you also see the rules that if there's any precedential effect or major implication, then you get out of this particular system and move it somewhere else. But isn't that a that's a line drawing exercise at that point? And how do you determine which consequences fall over and which consequences fall under that line? Where where does that line get drawn? Well, let's I mean. You have to know something about the field, uh, but we do it all the time. And you don't get into federal court on diversity unless you're $75,000 of mountain controversy. Uh, my view is if you actually look at the distribution of cases, you'll discover that most of the social security cases and so forth, usually say 98% of them, they settle for under ten dollars or $15,000, whatever the number is. And that's where you draw the particular line. That is, you don't ask this as a philosophical question. You ask it as a pragmatic question. What's the distribution of cases and what they're asking for? And as you put the nine lower and lower, what you do is get more and more cases leaking into the system. Are those the cases that you want to go into the judicial system and want to keep out? And what you'll do is you'll get a debate in practice. Is it $10,000 or $18,000? Somewhere in there. And what you then do is decide the number and then make adjustments for inflation. Um, if your question that you ask, essentially, if you treat it as a philosophical objection, then every effort in every legal system to decide, well, under $10,000, you go into small claims court, over $50,000, you go into this court, you can't make those distinctions anymore. What you ask about people is they pick an informed judgment so that it's not arbitrary or capricious. And let me give you another question, okay? When is it that people are allowed to get driver's licenses or not? And so I'm going to give you uh, two kinds of syndromes. One of them says, ah, we don't like driver's licenses. So anybody who's over 60 years of age could drive without a license on a public road. And so they said, well, that line is drawn in the first place. And then somebody else says, I hate teenagers. And no person is allowed to drive before the age of 25. And you're going to say, that's also crazy. So what do we do? In the end, the number becomes 15, 16, or 17. And the way in which with driver's license, we organize the transition is you get something known as a learner's permit, right? Which restricts what you can do. And then after you get your license and tells you you're 18, you can't drive at night or out of state or whatever it is. And so what we do is we manage the transition with some very specific kinds of rules rather than throwing up our hands and saying, we don't know what to do. And Justice Holmes was a great believer in, oh, it's all a matter of degree. I don't understand what's going on in that case. And he was wrong every time. Let me give you the one case which I think shows this, a case called Ride Out and Knock. And what you do is you have a trade-off. And the trade-off is having privacy by putting up a wall. And if you put the wall too high, you block everybody else's sunlight and air. And so where does the wall go? And well, you start off with, well, let's put it at two feet. And so I said, that's going to do no good, right? And then somebody else says, let's put it at 20 feet. And you say, well, that's kind of overkill. And so what they did is they put the wall at six feet. Now, why did they pick six feet? Because it meant that people would have to stand on their tippy toes to see over the wall. So it was high enough to preserve privacy and low enough to allow the free movement of air. It was not a random number. And so over and over again, when you start picking particular numbers, if you know the institutional framework, they don't sound as philosophically daunting as the way in which you put it. And what you have to do is solve those cases on a retail basis. You can't do it on a wholesale basis, which says, you know, uh, there's always going to be a line on age, and it always has to be 17, no matter what the particular purpose is, no matter why we're doing it. And we can do better than that. And if we actually look at the way these systems work, if there are large numbers of repetitive cases, that gives you a distribution. Generally speaking, we do far better than random uh, when we come up with one of these so-called lines. They're not arbitrary. 
It doesn't mean that you can't draw an arbitrary line. I've just given you all sorts of arbitrary lines, which simply don't respect one or the other issues. What you're always trying to do when you have two incommensurate values is to figure out on some kind of moral calculus uh, where the marginal benefits of one start to be exceeded to by the marginal cost of the other. And you have to pick a number because it turns out you cannot essentially, in most cases, when you have mass jurisdiction, litigate the uh, benefit cost line on an individual case basis. It's too costly. So what you do is you get the economy of rules with a thoughtful rule, and nobody should strike that down. Professor, you've talked about in the past how this case that we're talking about, as well as others, they seem to be decided on purely administrative law grounds with where the, the judges or justices don't seem particularly interested in the substantive law beneath it. And you've criticized that. It's, it strikes me that what you're talking about here is an instance of that, where arbitrary and capricious can mean certain things or different things if you have a conversance with that substantive law. Yeah, I mean, absolutely correct. What we have to do is you have to understand something. So this is my general difference in orientation between myself and both liberals and conservatives on the Supreme Court. I became a constitutional lawyer, an administrative lawyer, out of abject necessity rather than conscious choice. Uh, my original educational background was from England. And in 1964, when I studied law, my first legal assignment was, and you do not have to comment on it, Trace the origins of the contract of stipulatio from the time of the 12 tables through Justinian. That's close to a thousand years. And the key article was something written by a man named Barry Nichols on the meaning of the word veluti in Latin. Does it mean for instance, right? Or does it mean only these? You know, and that was how I started. And I was a private lawyer all the way through. I did a lot of stuff on medieval law, property law, American law. And it stood me in very good stead because every time I look at a problem, I look at it first as a private lawyer. And it was only when I got back to the hallowed halls of the Yale Law School in 1966 that all the stuff about the Constitution uh, and administrative states started to hit me. But what happened is people do not know enough of the organic statutes, that is the private law stuff. And so what they do is they're very indifferent or insensitive to the way in which these distinctions are made. And what they then do is they miss some very important ways in which these legal systems can be proved one sense or another. To take something as simple as what's the definition of private property, no sane person would ever say property is just the right to exclude. There are many cases, for example, of property in commons, where nobody has the right to exclude, but people have a right to enter by getting into a public river. And then you have to ask, well, how is that going to be modified or qualified? And then when there is the right to exclude, if I were to tell you your right and property is to exclude everybody else and then add it, oh, by the way, you're not allowed to enter the property yourself, you would say that's a very strange definition of property, right? The ability to exclude, but not the ability to use. And then you say, well, of course you can use it. And the next thing you do is you create a royal nuisance of one kind or another. Then that's not what we meant at all. And then you say, well, what's a nuisance? And you have to start figuring that out. And sure enough, by the time you get through some of those Supreme Court justices, they don't have the foggiest idea of how the nuisance law works or what the analogous rules are with respect to ultra hazardous activities and so forth. And they come up with the dumbest rulings imaginable. And a lot of that stuff happened when you had a bunch of other cases, Lucas in the 1980s, 1990s, the Supreme Court just did not know the rules. And so if you started to go back and look at the decisions of the state court that they were relying on, they were always misconceived. I mean, Ati de Bamza, whom I've mentioned before, did this terrific paper on Chevron uh, back in 2017, I guess, in the Yale Law Journal, talking about the way in which Justice Stevens used the idea of what was the administrative discretion of the change the rules one way or another. And what Justice Stevens did is he said, well, you give a lot of discretion to administrative court. And what he meant by that was if they decide to flip a rule over on no notice, you take the flip and accept it. You go back and read every single case that he cited, and they stand for exactly the opposite profession. They stand for the profession that there's a uniform practice on the way in which we deal with railway grants or with pensions of one kind or another. You follow that, and if any administrative judge decides to flip it over, we don't allow it because of the ad hoc justice. So what he did is he took a rule which says, follow the practice, and read it all to say, do whatever you want in the individual case, and nobody can challenge you on the basis of historical practice. He flipped everything 100% around. And that's why we had all this terrible problem associated with this particular case 
uh, when it came up before the Supreme Court in Loeb or Bright, um, which is to be understood in some sense as a parallel case associated with what you see in the Jokasasi case, right? Because what they said, you just can't do this. Decide to put somebody in and take somebody out. What you have to do is to figure out what the sources of these rights are, how stable they are, what the administrative structure is. And they often don't do this. I mean, I've been bounced out of court too many times. And I've been bounced out by judges who simply don't understand what the public trust doctrine turns out to be or anything associated with the question of what is the kind of protections that are given to independent advisory boards. I mean, the level of judicial ignorance on the part of very many distinguished judges about how these systems actually were put together in their private law origins uh, is not there. They're pure constitutionalists, and they sort of sound like Justice Sotomayor, completely unhinged from anything out there, and so that whatever she wants turns out to be some kind of moral necessity, which is why it is that her bureaucracy case is such a weak opinion. You know, that we talked about this the last time in our discussion about the practical effects, and I just want to go through Justice Sotomayor when she says there were two dozen agencies that can impose civil penalties in administrative proceedings, just to go down the list a little bit. There's the Merit Systems Protection Board, the Commodities Future Board, the, the Trade Trade Commission. There's the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Justice, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, Department of Education, Department of Health and Human Services, Food and Drug Administration, Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission, Federal Mine Safety, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The whole idea that this is earth shattering and it's going to open the floodgates of litigation. What do you think will happen next outside of the SEC in this specific fact set? Do you think that we're now going to see a slew of litigants in all of these other forum coming in and saying, look, gloves are off. You can't do this to me in this way. OK, let's just start. The first thing is she gave you 26 jurisdictions. She gave you zero statute, right? She didn't give you any particular instance. No, she from... references the statutes. She talks no, no, about she each... didn't give you a particular instance of a kind of activity that has been challenged under the statute. True. Well, you can't make those kinds of general judgments. So let's just take the one of the most reprehensible of our agencies, that which is associated with the Federal Trade Commission. Right? Now, they recently issued a, a ruling which was completely ignorant and utterly unpersuasive, which said that you should never allow a rule of reason to apply with respect to covenants not compete when you're starting to deal with uh, present or former employee. Now, it turns out there are 30 or 40 million contracts of this particular sort out there, all which have been judged under a rule of reason. And you start looking and say, what do you mean by rule of reason? Nobody understands, but I'm going to give you the same answer I gave you before. You start to look at the way these things deposit, and this is what you discover. A rule of reason in this area has three constraints. Typically, the covenants can't run for more than a year. Typically, they can only apply to the current line of business that you're working with. And typically, they can only apply to the geographical market in which you are practicing your trade. And anything else like that would be anti-competitive. And so the thing you would actually want the FTC to do was to look at these three rules and ask whether or not, if you follow that, there's going to be massive dangers that are going to start to take place. Uh, does she talk about that? Or does anybody lean on? Not a word. Uh, the report they write is 500 pages of intellectual fool scat. Um, it goes through every single piece of intellectual nonsense, and they don't get anything right because what the only thing they talk about is employer mobility. Well, you know, there are more things that are at stake. So will we see a flood of litigation here? In your opinion, will we see a flood of litigation across all of these agencies? Well, I mean, the answer is we will see more litigation across these agencies. But there's a further question. Is this because we're getting rid of the intellectual rot that grew up underneath the Biden administration? Or is it because we have people conniving in one sort of illicit fashion to take advantage? And you just can't answer that question in the abstract. You look at Lope of Bright and you see somebody who's told and that there's a guy in the agency who can tell you you have to pay $700 a day for somebody to sit on your boat to watch you when your crew get two or $300 a day, and it takes away 40% of your profits. Uh, but we're doing it because we don't have a sufficient budgetary allocation from Congress. To which the answer is, if you need the allocation from Congress, go to Congress and get yourself an appropriation. Don't take it out of the hides of the people whom you're dealing with, because you can drive them out of business. 
And she didn't see that. There was an opinion that actually said it was clear that they could do that. My view is nothing is clear about appropriations powers looking under a statute having to do with a particular area, unless you take it against the background of the specific authorization that all revenue builders have to begin in the House. And this is a revenue type thing, and it didn't begin there. So you look at that, and it turns out what you have to do is to strike it down. What happened is, and this is, again, the minimalism of Justice Roberts, Chief Justice, which I'm not a hundred fan of, he did not tell you anything about the actual session. He said, Chevron is no longer the law. That's fine. But he didn't tell you, and by the way, this is how it applies in this case. So we now got two or three years more of uncertainty. And when it turned out that all the information you needed to decide that case was already spread upon the record. And so what I would have done is written an opinion and say, well, I see people say it's clear that they can do it and clear that they can't do it. Uh, this is the way it comes out in this case, and it's clear that they could not do it. And that would give you much more guidance than you get in this situation. That's a case where the minimalism turns out, to my mind, to start to be bad. Professor, do, do you think that judges will come to a greater appreciation of the substance of law once these administrative law cases start to get kicked into the Article Three courts? I hope so. Look, I mean, I litigate a lot in these courses, and my strategy in almost every case that I deal with is to give, if I can, a coherent common law account of how a particular matter should be solved in order to push aside things that are happening elsewhere. So one of the cases that's very important are all the Medicare pricing cases. I don't know if you're familiar with them, in which it turns out the government said, well, if you don't like what we're going to impose upon you, you can withdraw from all of your business. And these are a monopolist saying that. And so the basic line against them is very simple. Look at the Sherman Act and ask yourself the following question. Somebody is given a cartel price increase, and they accept it. And then when they start to sue, somebody says, well, you can't object to this because you consented to the imposition, right? That's the government's position. So what they're doing is they're arguing that the consent line is decisive against monopoly power, where every single antitrust case, every single regulatory body, says that can't possibly be the rule. Because if it is, in fact, a defense, then you can never have actions for cartel enforcement territorial divisions or anything of the sort. And the government missed all of that. And so my view is once you put the two things together, all of these statutes start to go. And that's just a classic illustration of why it is that you have to know what church you're in. And the church of consent does not deal with monopoly power. It deals with standard cases of competitive market, where if I buy something from you in a competitive market, and I say, I want to get out of the contract because I don't like it, and we say, oh, you can get out of it, then every single transaction in the competitive market is going to be undone, right? So you need to have different rules to deal with the problems of monopoly than the rules that you need to do with contractual enforcement in competitive markets. And the rules are exactly the opposite. In one case, you need strong and definite enforcement. And in the other case, you need to have essentially an equitable rule that says that anybody who's a victim of monopolization practice can challenge it in court. Exactly the opposite position. But we really appreciate your time. Really appreciate your insight. Always a lively discussion. I hope you'll come back again. Thank you so much. Okay. Next year will be another problem. I'm sure. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. And thank you for having me. Take care, Professor. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us on The Justice Insiders. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts to subscribe, rate, and review The Justice Insiders. I'm your host, Greg Sofer, and until next time, be well.